your inner presence. Your inner presence. That is right. How you doing? One thousand for that. I think I think you're the next one. I'm the next one. Yeah. Got it. Stacy, you took Stacy's chair. That's right. <laughs> See, he messed things up. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Fall is just fall. <laughs> if this fall is just gonna fall. I know it's not right. <laughs> yeah, I can. It's right in there. <laughs> they grow, they just be real better. They doing? They put you down there because you won. What was that? They put you down there because you wore one. You wore Maybe, one. Maybe I don't know. It's got to be. I think they just put me down here so that <laughs> it just shuffled the deck. Oh. Well, we didn't want three more. Oh yeah, that makes sense. It been yeah, Shannon, yeah. Stacy Shannon and and uh, Stacy. And all three of them on that side. Too. Yeah, well, that would be real good for us. Y'all <laughs> 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 oh, would do that with it with three men down here. <laughs> Welcome to the right 
side. <laughs> Welcome to the dark side. I said the right side. side. <laughs> stage right, I should say. Or is it, or is it stage left? I could never I can't remember. <laughs> That's why I didn't go in the theater. Yeah. Um, I have more, oh. I was going to say, it feels more spacious here than usual. Yeah. That's what it's Call this meeting of uh, June fifteenth order. We're going to begin with the invocation, Reverend Alan Gernon from First Presbyterian and Westminster Presbyterian. I didn't know you had both. <laughs> You're a busy lady. Yes. Yeah. Let us pray. Creator God, we pause on this beautiful day to give you thanks for your presence here among us for this meeting. We are grateful for our city and for all of its servants and every citizen of every age, gender, race, and religion. Give us all uh, an attitude of respect for one another. Guide these leaders with your wisdom. Give them clear focus on the task at hand. Open their eyes, ears, hearts and minds to the needs put forth today. May your desires, Lord, for our city become our purpose. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Would you now join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Gail. Welcome to our study session. Uh, we have two presentations this evening. The first is uh, Katrina with the airport. And uh, we're going to talk about just terminal needs tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present to you um, an update on the ter Terminal Area Master Plan uh, that we also call the TAMP. So if you hear the TAMP, that's, the, that's what we're referring to. Um, I want to also thank several of our board members for being present this evening. Uh, they've gotten some of this information, but this is more of a formalized presentation to give you all of the information at one time. Um, one thing I do want you guys to know is that this is a preliminary study, or we're in the preliminary process, so we haven't gotten to the point to where we're ready to make decisions yet. This is just to give you guys an informational session on where we are and where we hope to go um, when this is completed. Okay. Um, so before we get into the study and where we are, I wanted to talk to you about how we got here. Um, I presented to you guys about two years ago, and we talked about the facility needs of, at the airport, talked about the terminal and where we are, and you know, its renovation needs and possibly a new terminal. Uh, we talked about the control tower and our T-hanger needs. Um, so with that being said, you know, we talked about that, and then in addition to that, we had the new jet service come into play in 2017. Um, we were able to make some renovations to the terminal to help reconfigure it and make it possible to where we can have the 50-passenger regional jet service. However, we still have significant needs that we need to, to meet. Um, so that's what this uh, plan is going to help us figure out is what we need, how we can go about accomplishing that goal. Um, and how we go about moving forward. So in addition to that, in 2019, we passed the, the capital improvement sales tax was passed, which included the airport, um, and $4.25 million was allocated towards the terminal and control tower projects. Um, in addition to that, we hit 10,000, over 10,000 employments in 2019. So that made us a primary airport, opening us up to $1 million in airport improvement funding. So all of that is kind of what led us to this point to where we're ready to uh, conduct a terminal area master plan. 
In addition to that, it's something that the FAA requires um, in order for us to know what kind of terminal we're, we're eligible for to build. Um, so that's what we're working on. Um, again, we're in the very preliminary stages, but we just wanted to update you guys and let you guys know where we are. I have with me today Ty Sander and Nick Brown with CMT. Ty has been with the airport. Um, he's worked with the airport for well over 20 years. Um, they helped us with our master plan and they've also helped us accomplish several projects. Two of those top of mind projects are 10 to 8 lighting project, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. In addition to that, the runway to overlay. Um, so they'll be on hand as well as myself to answer any questions. But at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Nick and let him give you guys the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Katrina, and good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in front of you tonight uh, to talk about a lot of the pro progress that we're making so far um, with the Terminal Area Master Plan. It's an exciting time at the airport, and uh, we're really looking forward to, to, to getting in front of you as we go on down through the process. Uh, just a real quick, what we'll talk about, uh, just a, a kind of an overview a little bit more about the project and how we got here and what we're aiming to accomplish. Um, talk about the draft forecast of aviation demand so the preliminary results of our forecast um, that we've uh, been working on to date uh, and what we're hoping to submit to the FAA for their approval and then uh, finally talk about some of the terminal site concepts and uh, as Katrina said and I want to echo this it's very preliminary um, I liken this to we're throwing the spaghetti on the wall and we're just kind of seeing what sticks at this point and then what sticks will take a little bit more of a, a more of a fine uh, finer look at to, and, and refine those options and and look at that in a little bit more depth so why are we why are we doing a terminal area master plan or a TAMP um, some you know, a lot of what led into this is what the, you know, the existing facility that you have today uh, it is an older facility it was built and designed and configured before 9-11 so there's a lot of requirements that came out of that as we all have experienced for the last 20 years and, and th aviation has changed and aviation is still changing as we all know so um, a lot of the security requirements that did not exist when that building was built exist today so it's been you know, retrofitted in a ways uh, it lacks a lot of modern amenities some of the conveniences for passengers you know the most obvious of which is places to plug in your phone and, and good Wi-Fi those kind of things that are almost taken for granted as you go into some of your larger airports and your more modern airports they don't exist today at, at the airport um, the configuration the layout where you go for certain functions in the airport are not intuitive when you think about airports and what you experience elsewhere as well as you know the building is older and it's becoming more costly to maintain and operate uh, secondly you know the traffic has changed at Cape Girardeau very significantly um, the type of air service has changed as we've as we've discussed as well as you know we don't want our future potential to be uh, limited by the facility that we have today so we want our facility as we move forward to be able to be flexible and accommodate things as they change as and as aviation changes in the future what we're trying to do uh, you know the first thing is we want to evaluate the demand which is something we're going to talk about here tonight what we think is going to happen what we need to accommodate in the future uh, look at what the condition of the existing facilities are at a more detailed level and what that replacement cost might be incorporate some stakeholder and tenant feedback so what does the airline say they need you know we, we've talked with the airlines we've talked with some of the other users at the airport what do they need and what do they see some of the shortfalls are and, and where can things be improved and then obviously we want to look at you know in a holistic level where's the best spot at the airport to have the term uh, a terminal is it where it is today is it elsewhere on the airfield uh, what, are, what kind of spaces do we need to accommodate the traffic that we're projecting to be able to need to be able to accommodate? How do we lay that out best so that it serves the passengers in the best way possible? And then obviously we want to be flexible. So we want to try and future proof whatever is built in the future. And then obviously the final, the, the, the base outcome of our study is to set the parameters for which the new terminal will be designed. We won't be designing the terminal as part of the study, but we're going to set kind of almost like the the, the ground rules for what will be designed I'll, I won't get into the detail on this but this is just a, a, a quick almost status update as far as the project goes everything in green is what we've completed to date a lot of the project initiation and things that happen in parallel the uh, draft forecast numbers have been developed we've done the inventory 
Uh, we've, we've gotten a lot of data collection out of the way and things that will feed into the study. We're in the process of documenting the forecast that will be submitted to the FAA um, and, and developing facility requirements that are based on that forecast right now. Next steps, we'll get into you know, alternatives evaluation, look at, again, what sticks to the wall. We'll start looking at it with a little bit better of a lens, a, a finer grain lens, uh, and then get, ultimately get into what the program and what the building needs to contain and how much and, and where and so on. So moving on with the forecast of aviation demand. And we're going to start off with you know, talking in two different sections. We'll talk about his, uh, commercial passengers and the operations of the aircraft that are related to commercial pa airline passengers. And then we'll talk about non-commercial passengers, so your general aviation, your training, and so on. So the first thing you know, we start off with when every time we do a forecast is we look at what, what's happened in the last five to ten years. How have things changed and what maybe have influenced those changes? So we start off with historical observations. And what we've noticed from those observations is passenger traffic has significantly increased when two things happened. Number one, a network carrier is operating at this airport. So a United, a Delta, one of your big airlines, a Southwest. Those, when that happens, you have more passengers. And the second thing is when that service on that network carrier is to an, an active hub. So in this case, Chicago O'Hare. And one thing I, I would say, that a third bullet that's not on there, is when that aircraft that they're operating to that hub is a regional jet, jet style aircraft, not a smaller nine seat passenger airplane. So one thing, we, and when, when that happens, you know, in the last year, we noticed the traffic increased 30, approximately 30% when all those conditions were met. Well, you know, and that has really served to, you know, to, to bolster the traffic at Cape Girardeau. And as Katrina said, we've, we crossed that magic threshold of 10,000 employments, and that has some significant funding impl implications for the airport in terms of what it is uh, entitled from the FAA. So we, we've come up with you know, uh, several different scenarios for a forecast, and the baseline is what we will plan to, but there's also a high and a low boundary. So some of the key assumptions for our baseline forecast uh, the first one is that Cape Girardeau remains as part of the EAS program or the Essential Air Service program. And that program is, is through the FAA and the Department of Transportation. And it's so they subsidize the air service to smaller communities that are further away from larger airports to help you know, maintain that service. So our key assumption is, is that, we may, that you know, Cape Girardeau remains in that program. Second, that the air service remains on a network carrier to a network hub. So those are key. So we're maintaining those conditions that we've really seen traffic growth from. Third, that the, 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 tra the service remains on a 50-seat RJ for the next 10 years. Beginning in 2030, thereabouts, uh, our assumption is that that transitions from a 50-seat RJ to what is known uh, uh, a little bit larger aircraft, which is approximately 65 seats by the time you have now have a co uh, coach cabin and a first-class cabin in that, seat, in that uh, aircraft. That transition, we're assuming, will take place over approximately five years. You know, start off in 2030. One of the flight, one of the two flights a day, will be on the larger aircraft. The other will remain on the 50 seat. And then, as you get further on into 2035, that will transition over to the all uh, of the 65 seat uh, configuration uh, aircraft. As far as our low scenario, we really are assuming a lot of the same fleet change um, and, and uh, flight change, but the uh, lower growth rate in terms of load factor, basically how many people are on each airplane on average. So we're seeing a little bit lower of a, uh, a growth rate, but still assuming the same transition to the 65 seat aircraft. Our high scenario, again, a much higher growth rate, so we're going to fill the planes more as we go into, into time. Um, but also that growth could be supplemented by the arrival of a, a, what we call an ultra-low cost carrier or a ULCC, something like a, a Spirit Airlines or an Allegiant or a Frontier. And that would be, uh, you know, non-daily service a couple times a week to a vacation type destination. More than likely something like Florida or, some, or a bit Las Vegas is where those typically happen. So the high case scenario assumes that might happen as well as we get further into time. Now the big question mark that we're all facing these days is what are the impacts of COVID-19? And we do have different assumptions with our different scenarios as far as what our recovery rate is. Um, so far what we're estimating a reduction in traffic for 2020, approximately 60% uh, reduction in employments. And that's based off of uh, 
data that we got from the airport in terms of employments from through the month of April. Um, our different scenarios, again, we are looking at different timelines as far as when we recover to pre-COVID levels, so 2019 traffic levels. Our low case scenario or our worst case, we're looking at, we're thinking a five year, so out to 2025, we will not return into 2019 levels in 2025. Baseline, we're looking at a three year and then the high case, a two year recovery. One thing I'll go back, one thing I will say is that we, uh, one of some belief we really do have as far as our forecast team goes, we do believe that Cape Girardeau is somewhat shielded from the volatility a lot of other airports are having, and that's primarily because of that essential air service uh, status that you have. So that, and again, that is a baseline assumption that we're, that, that maintain, you maintain that status going forward. So the last, the, the chart here, and these are the passenger projections. These are annual employments. So these are people getting on an airplane at Cape Girardeau. And you can see the three different trend lines there and the different rates of recovery. Uh, you can see, obviously, we were, we were, had quite a bit of increase between 2018 and 2019. 2020, obviously, is a, a big dip for each, each scenario. Um, but then our baseline, we're out uh, in our out year for our planning period is 2040. Uh, we're just over uh, 15,000 annual employments at that point. So we do see a fairly robust growth moving forward. Um, and that's what we ultimately want to plan this facility to, to meet, uh, accommodate. Okay, moving on from the commercial, so uh, not, uh, the passenger, commercial passenger operations at the airport. Now moving on to uh, based aircraft and non-commercial operations, so your general aviation and the aircraft that are based at Cape Girardeau. We make projections of both as part of the forecasting effort. Excuse me, I'll take a quick drink. But similar to the passengers, we look at uh, different scenarios, a, a base, a high and a low uh, on based aircraft. And uh, we see that uh, our baseline aircraft, uh, our baseline scenario we're looking at, you know, currently you have 73 aircraft based at the airport today. Uh, we do know that there is a little bit of unmet, unmet demand out there today in the terms of a wait list for hangars. So we, are, we do see that this is pretty feasible to do, uh, but growing out to about 94, just under 100 aircraft based at the airport. And again, that can go up or down a little bit, but our, that's our baseline. In terms of operations, again, we look at how things have behaved or what's happened in the past, uh, looking at our historical um, conclusions. Uh, we looked at uh, how Cape Girardeau has um, grown in the last uh, few years when compared to uh, regional and national trends in the same sector of non-commercial uh, operations, as well as then based aircraft. And, and we look for that, and, and one of the things we try to do with that is we try to tie, that, uh, tie those together or make that relationship then to be able to project forward. And so one thing that we've noticed in that uh, analysis is, you know, Cape Girardeau has definitely performed better than the region and the nation in terms of non-commercial operations. You have, Cape Girardeau has grown, whereas nationally and regionally you've seen a decline. So that relationship told us it's not really one we want to project to. So then we looked at, you know, the relationship of operations and based aircraft, which definitely had a much closer relationship. So the historical analysis then led us to believe that we need to project future operations and base them on based aircraft at the airport. So we took that based aircraft forecast that we have and we looked at the relationship and how operations have grown over time uh, and as a ratio of, of based aircraft to operations and came up with our different scenarios, a high, a base, and a low. Um, and you can see that you know we are showing um, growing from approximately that far away, uh, 25,000 today, just over 25 to 30,000 today, uh, up to over uh, 35,000 in the future. Now, one thing I do want to note, and I know it's been in the news a little bit lately, these numbers don't yet include um, any projected operations that might result from the flight, uh, Southeast Missouri State flight school happening at the airport. Um, our first initial pass, and this is based on some benchmarking and other flight schools, that could significantly increase the number of operations. So that's something we are currently looking at and will definitely be in the next iteration. This table here is just a real quick summary of the, number, of the numbers in the forecast so far. Again, this is all very preliminary at this point. Uh, we're in the process of documenting it and as well as incorporating the Southeast Missouri Flight School uh, into the operations numbers. That will be documented up and um, the next step will then be submitted to both MoDOT and the FAA for their review and their comment. 
Um, ultimately, once we get through any of their comments and changes that they request, uh, we'll hopefully their approval and that will become an approved forecast by the FAA. Moving on now to the terminal site concepts. Um, again, this is a very high level look. So we're, the, you know, we're looking at very, very much a conceptual level. No real decisions have been made yet, but we're trying to evaluate what's the best direction to head into at this point. So we started off um, with a first round of evaluation. At this level, we really looked at areas of the airport. Okay, what are, and, and if you look at the configuration of the airfield, the airfield really is set up into four quadrants of where you could put any kind of facility, whether it's a terminal, whether it's hangars, an apron, or any kind of other development. There's four basic quadrants available. Most of the, well, not most, but all of the existing development today is in that northeast quadrant. You know, it's where your terminal is and all your hangars and everything are. Um, but you have southeast, southwest, and then obviously the northwest quadrants as well. So um, we came up with eight concepts in the northeast, three, uh, two on, the, on each of the south quadrants, and then three concepts on the northwest quadrant. Obviously, there's fewer concepts because there's less variables in play in those, in those greenfield sites. Um, you know, a terminal could, isn't necessarily influenced by roads or um, other facilities that you have to shape it around, so that's why there's fewer concepts in those. So we took, and this is, I apologize because this is pretty small in that table, but we, we looked at those four quadrants and we evaluated them qualitatively against one another using these uh, set of evaluation criteria. And, what, and you know, it, as you read that, the, each one of those is, that's the definition of how we're, or the question we're asking for each one of those criteria. And we gave each one for each quadrant a ranking or a rating of a negative one, a zero, or a positive one. And what that it relates to is, does it perform well? It gets a positive. If it's kind of a neutral or no impact, it gets a zero. If it performs negatively, it gets a negative one. That yielded out a, a, a basic evaluation matrix, um, and you can see the, to the top two quadrants scored, and probably of no surprise to most of the folks here, are either the northwest or the northeast quadrants. So the closest ones to um, the, the, the access roads that you have today, as well as then the northeast quadrant where everything is already located today. And the types of things we looked at are, you know, from a safety standpoint, is the is a, a concept or a terminal concept in this quadrant going to, you know, is it going to generate more runway crossing? So that's a safe, if it does, that's a safety issue that you want to try to avoid. Uh, you know, the fewer aircraft you have crossing a runway, the better and the safer operations are. Um, we looked at utilities. Is there utility infrastructure readily available at that site already? Or is it going to be, you're going to have to extend utilities a far distance to get to a, a possible development? And then does a, uh, you know, another, does this concept or does developing a concept in this area open up a lot more area for you to develop other facilities, other rela aviation related facilities um, nearby or adjacent? And are there opportunities that are gained from that? So then we took those two uh, quadrants and we looked at and we developed, okay, how might you configure or where might you put a terminal in, in those areas and what might you have to think about in, when you do that? So we looked at now a concept level, and, and these are just some very high-level sketches. Again, this is like looking out of an airplane at 30,000 feet. As we get down to our further refinements, it might be looking at it, looking out from a drone. You'll be much lower and have much more detail and much more granularity that you can see things. So we looked at several, you know, eight in this case, different concepts in the northeast quadrant. How might you, you know, be able to accommodate it? And you know, obviously starting with building a new terminal directly adjacent to your existing terminal, or tearing down your existing terminal and building a new terminal right on top. All that, you know, concept one and concept eight are those two. And then we looked at different locations in the northeast quadrant and what might be able to, you might be able to accomplish and what maybe some of the impacts of doing that are. In the northwest quadrant, you know, we came up with three. And again, because this is a greenfield site and you have very few limitations at this point, you know, you, you can pretty much do exactly what you want. So you, it, more of where in the quadrant um, is the concept developed relative to the airport or the roads is, are what the changes are here. We came up with three, whether it's close to the, run, the airfield or further away from the airfield and closer to the intersection or not. So we took all those and again, now we have another set of evaluation criteria. A lot of these are, you know, we carried over and we're getting a little more detailed as we go further in, we'll get a little more detailed as we go. There's also a few additional uh, criteria and some fell out that are no longer applicable. 
uh, you know, one that's no longer applicable because you, the, we're assuming all the land in both the northeast and the northwest quadrants are already owned. So the, what, the question of whether or not you have to acquire additional property fell out. So that's why that one may not be here. So that's just an example. Plug that into an, another evaluation matrix very similar to the one we had, but obviously a little bit bigger this time to get down to three shortlisted concepts. And again, we'll carry these three forward and there might be some nuances of each that change, uh, but we have two concepts from the Northwest Quadrant came out as the top, as two of the top three, and then one from the Northeast Quadrant. So one concept in the, in the existing area where everything is already developed, and then we have two different concepts um, up basically up in the Greenfield site. And, and if you can see behind me, I think this is a little bit bigger. Um, the, the three that kind of shook out, the one in the northeast quadrant is uh, concept two. Yeah, two. Um, and what that is is basically moving the terminal closer to the airfield. And with the, con the idea on that concept was center your new vehicle parking lot on the existing apron to be able to maybe reuse that infrastructure that you already have. Now we know it's in a little bit of uh, you know, need of repair as we go forward. If that stays as an aircraft apron, it's gonna to need to be rehabilitated. But if you repurpose it for vehicle parking, the lifespan of that might be much longer and you can leverage that existing infrastructure. Um, so the idea of that concept was basically center the new terminal on building your, your turning your existing apron into a parking lot and then you build a building there and then you can build a parallel taxiway parallel to runway 220, which also accomplishes another um, safety aim of the FA or safety goal or objective of the FA to provide a full length parallel taxiway to that runway. So it accomplishes a lot of uh, different um, goals and objectives of various stakeholders. And then the two that you have over in the Northwest quadrant, you have uh, a close in concept. So you have to build less Air, our airside infrastructure in terms of taxiway, but you're obviously going to have to extend roads and utilities further on. So we're going to look at that balance and that trade-off and what might be a better um, financial decision to make, whether or not you, is, it, is it more beneficial to build more utility and roadway or more is it, is it easier to build airside infrastructure. So we're going to look at those changes. And again, some nuances from other concepts that didn't necessarily get shortlisted may come back into into some of these concepts as we move forward and refine them and add greater detail. So finally, again, our next steps, um, we're gonna you know, continue coordinating with the FAA and MoDOT um, on, on the forecast first and getting that approval, but we'll also seek their input on the, a lot of the concepts and, and some of the decision-making process. Uh, we're going to compete, uh, complete our, our forecast documentation, submit that to the, the airport and the city for, their, for your approval, um, and then that will ultimately go to FAA and MoDOT. Uh, we are in the process right now of developing facility requirements, and we talk about in the terminal facility requirements, you know, how many ticket counters are we going to need, how many security lanes are we going to need, how big the hold room need to be um, to serve the projected t size and type of traffic that you'll have. And then ultimately, you know, then we'll uh, refine those shortlisted concepts down, get some more detail, be able to actually maybe um, quantify some of the traits and attributes of each, and then score them against each other and hopefully make the decision uh, and get down to the point where, you know, the airport and the city can make a decision, okay, what's the best place to put a terminal and how to, what's the best way to uh, provide this facility as we move forward in the future. And that's all I have. Any questions? I can't think of any. I think, uh, you know, one of the big things about your uh, non-commercial air traffic is that, uh, you know, if we build another T hangar or two T hangers, it's going to mean a lot more traffic, Absolutely. A, lot more, a lot more planes there and a lot more traffic. And the uh, CMO proposal is really promising. Yes. And I, and I will say that that has the potential to really increase your operations for sure, as well as your fuel sales, which will help and everything. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.
Gail, do you need to get those yeah. out? Okay. have a proclamation to present this evening to the safe house for women. Whereas the semi-annual Safe House for Women Spring Food Drive by Seymour Media will operate from May 18th through June 16th, 2020. And whereas this marks the fifth annual and ninth food drive for the Safe House for Women food drives by Seymour Media. And whereas area businesses participate every year, providing a free item or discount for every food donation. And whereas Safe House for Women food drives by Seymour Media, a non-paid food source in Southeast Missouri that feeds families and has provided food for over 400 families in our region. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Bob Fox, Mayor of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, to hereby celebrate Safe House for Women food drives by Seymour Media's fifth anniversary and encourage all citizens to support the efforts of Safe House for Women food drives by Seymour Media so that it may continue to help our community in times of need. Communication and reports. Uh, council, anybody? Mayor, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, two passings. One was Leonard Cook, who was the retired pastor from St. John's Logian, who had come and, and done prayer here numerous times and, and helped out with scouting. I think maybe you all remember, maybe not some of the newer ones, but uh, remembered Leonard. And also, um, local business owner and developer Eugene Holloway. Uh, we send condolences to their family and uh, Eugene built a lot of homes to developing and, and helped a lot of people out to do. Uh, some good news, something positive was that um, I want to say thank you to Cape Public Schools. Um, I had the honor of going to graduation this weekend and, and granted with everything that's going on, I really thought it was a top-notch event. And uh, I know Nate with his daughter and my daughter both graduated, but I thought it was a phenomenal event, great turnout. They put a lot of attention to detail in it, and uh, I thought that was really neat. So uh, not all that is lost when we're going through some of the changes we're seeing, but just wanted to pass <coughs> on that. Yeah, you stole my thunder. I was going to say the same thing of um, these schools are finding ways to put on the graduations in unique ways given the circumstances and they're they're really making it special yeah. for for these kids for this class of 2020 that they kind of had their their uh their senior year prematurely you know put to a stop so um it was really unique it was fun it was they made, they did a good job of it. it was top notch so anybody else yeah i would like to um just mention that um that in my mind, there, there are two issues um, that are kind of before us that we've been talking about um, that may not require a council vote. Um, they may not require a city ordinance of any sort, um, but they seem to be growing issues of concern in our community, um, one of which is the, um, the pedestrian signs down Broadway. Um, the other is the, um, the uh, Confederate States of America uh, monument at Ivor Square. Um, and so I think when, when, when issues like that are, are there, there are many different um, opinions. Um, I think they're, they're 
growing in concern in our community, I'd, I'd like to see them both uh, scheduled for our uh, next, for, to be on the agenda, actually, um, at our next council meeting. Um, I think that in both of those issues, there's a lot to um, hear from the community as well as the staff. And so I think they warrant a, an agenda item. All I wanted to say, I don't well, know. Well, they if can I, be discussed whether they're agenda item or not. So that. Well, it, those are both issues where I think staff is starting to want to, to get our, our opinion, our majority vote. And, and so I think they, I think it would be best for our staff if they have a, an actual vote. I think it also, by being on the agenda, it would give our community the knowledge of, of when these things are going to be spoken about. Um, our staff would be able to prepare and uh, people would, would know when they could come and speak to an item that is on the agenda. Uh, we're kind of hitting them piecemeal um, in our casual conversations. Um, so I, I would like to see them on the agenda. I don't know. I, don't know if we need a vote on that or, or well, how that works. You, but. I'll talk about that in just a minute, but we may not need those items on the agenda. You'll see why. Okay. Dan? Mm -hmm. Nothing? Anybody else? Okay. Uh, before I do anything, uh, I want to read a letter that uh, uh, some of us on the council had some input putting together. We all reviewed it. Uh, as a draft, and uh, I said I would read it at this meeting. It says, on behalf of the city of Cape Girardeau, I'd like to take this opportunity to address the cruel treatment and murder of George Floyd. We also recognize that there are many others that have suffered a similar fate as a result of the inherent racism, hatred, violence, and murder that has occurred in cities all over our nation. We reject this hatred, violence, and racism that exists in our country. Police Chief West Blair, emotionally expressed his rebuke of the unacceptable actions of the Minneapolis officer that took the life of Mr. Floyd, and we are confident that under his leadership this will not occur in our city. The Cape Girardeau Police Department employs officers that first and foremost work to help, protect, and serve the citizens of our city and hold up the banner of justice and equality. Training in the areas of harassment and anti-discrimination and proper use of force is constantly updated along with a multitude of other tactics. The department has no tolerance for actions by law enforcement that violate the law, standards, procedures, or protocols, and any officer that does not comply will be disciplined or removed. The department has been working to build trust between the officers and our minority and marginalized populations. We understand that encounters with law enforcement are generally negative interactions, causing stress and tension between the citizens and law enforcement. We endeavor to change this experience. We also recognize that many of our citizens do not feel safe in their own neighborhoods and that generational poverty plagues some of these same areas. We as a city, in cooperation with many community organizations, are striving to eliminate this disparity and bring our community together. We are one CAPE. Our city continues to choose unity to project hatred, racism, and violence against all members of our community. We respect the rights of our citizens to protest, to express their opinions, to contact their council member or come, to the, or come to our meetings. Regardless of race, religion, or neighborhood, everyone should be safe and feel safe where they live. We want the city of Cape Girardeau to be a city of opportunity for everyone, and we believe that working together, better days are ahead. Uh, I'll report on some other things going on right now. The, we're still having the uh, uh, county COVID emergency calls twice a week. Uh, the county Health Department updates us on cases and uh, general things going on. Uh, generally, cases are increasing uh, a few per day. And the, uh, the interesting thing is that the ages of those cases have vastly increased in the age group of 20 to 29, whereas before it was primarily above 50. Uh, most of the cases now are being contracted at work, where people work. So uh, if you're at work, take those precautions. Uh, still having a weekly conference call with Governor Parson and five other mayors. 
uh, talking about how things are going on around the state and other cities, most of them bigger than Cape Girardeau, uh, but still yet uh, it keeps us in tune to what's going on around the state and helps guide the governor's decisions. Uh, we had a great groundbreaking today at Capitol Hall Park for the splash pad and the uh, that whole area of uh, Capitol Hall Park. It was, uh, and as I drove by coming here, there were still 15 or 20 little kids out there splashing around in that water. And it's it's a neat, neat feature. And it's, uh, it's just the beginning of what's happening at Capitol Hall Park because it's going to be more and more this year and next year and the year after. Uh, Wednesday, we have a groundbreaking for our city hall project at Common Police Courthouse. Uh, 10 o'clock Wednesday morning. Uh, have a CMO or SIMPO board meeting on Wednesday. And uh, we don't meet again until the 6th of July. So before then, we've got our 4th of July celebration. So we've got to bring that up. That's uh, a big deal at the arena building. Uh, I was going to mention the two items that Stacy brought up. And uh, I know there's one individual here tonight to talk about the uh, signs on Broadway, and uh, we'll address that when he brings that up. Uh, the other issue about the uh, uh, Confederate monument at Common Police Courthouse, uh, I think what's going to happen is that all those monuments are going to be taken down during the construction process, and we may store them, and when construction's finished, then we'll evaluate what to do with them and how to put them back and where to put them. That it seems to be the simplest thing. The, the, I know the Arbor statue has to be moved because it's so close. Uh, the other one's tall, not really in the way, but there are three separate monuments there. And uh, uh, we think it might be best just to move them all and then reinstall them so right now we don't have to worry about any of that until we get this process done. Okay. Do you uh, know anything about, has there been any discussion about what that reinstallation process? We have or? not, we okay. have not talked about that. Uh, I think when that happens, I think that uh, uh, I did talk to uh, uh, Denise Lincoln. Mm -hmm. We had a lot to do with uh, the uh, whole process. I mean, the, the Ivor Square anyway, and and renaming an Ivor Square and getting the statue of Mr. Ivers. And uh, she, uh, I sent you all a note that she sent me right before this meeting. Uh, I would think that that she would have to be active, I would want her to be actively involved in this whole thing. Absolutely. And uh, as well as some other people involved with the historical society here in Cape Girardeau. And we'll do that. It'll be a year, year and a half before that would even come to fruition. So we've got time to think about that and develop some ideas. Great. Is that okay? That's why I thought. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Not, I mean, not, there's no sense having that as an agenda item if yes. we're not going to deal with that for a while. But yeah. that I seems, heard, I'm sorry, with I the construction, that seems to be the best case scenario. We don't want uh, any of them damaged and not sure what's going to happen there. But anyway. Uh, Can I just make a quick comment? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm reading the room. And I'm looking at these faces and I'm seeing like not what they want to hear. So how fast are you thinking about removing these items for storage or for safekeeping? I mean, is that something we think we can do well, right the construction, away? We're having the ribbon cutting Wednesday. Constructions, I'm not sure when they're going to start tearing off the front of that old library, but that statue's got to be moved pretty quick. Uh, yeah, I, know, I know their original plans were to just move the Ivers. The Ivers uh, statue, um, and then just protect the other one. And so we'll need to talk with them about what what that looks like, and we'll we'll bring it back. But but ultimately, where they need to be placed, there's actually several other small statues around and monuments. There's uh, some that, that recognize police officers that were killed in line of duty. Those may Vietnam. Yeah. Need to go to uh, the police station. So um, I think a conversation about about that and, and doing that will be good. So we'll we'll have um, we'll have the contractor look at uh, you know whether it's best to build some around to protect them uh, or to to move them or move some, not move all, and we'll bring that plan to you. 
but certainly where they where they finally rest is a is a decision that is to be made, and uh, we'll talk with the whole group and get that input from uh, anyone that wants to give us input. And uh, I know somebody mentioned also seeing if we could talk with uh, the original group that gave us each of the statutes and and uh, see see if there were those. Uh, groups still exist and get their input. So draw from a wide range of, of uh, folks and then you might get to it. So they're, they're not necessarily all being taken down. We, our, our current plan was not to necessarily take each monument down. Uh, but we, you know, we just sort of started, what, we, what we've been looking at for sure was the Ivers was too close. It, we, it had to be. And so we've really concentrated on that. So we'll look at and see if we need to take those down, or if you'd rather us move, you know, move them temporarily. You know, we can certainly do that. Uh, but certainly, there's no decision that everyone is going to stay right where it is. So I don't know if that helps. As as part of the process, is um, is the fountain and everything is that going to be kind of taken out or redone or anything? Is that in the way of the construction? I think the fountain is is the idea was the fountain was going to stay where it was. Okay. It's all plumbed and everything, mm -hmm. you know, you can't, uh, that would be hard. It'd be a lot bigger process to move up. Well, because I was just thinking, you know, because it's all so close in there together, getting machinery in and out of that whole area is just a whole kettlefish. Yeah. We, we, will, we will evaluate all that Well, I, I feel like we're back to where we started <laughs> in this conversation. <laughs> um, I, I bring this all up because, I, like I said, I, I think it's a growing question in our community, um, and it, I don't, I haven't heard the, that question about the, the statue of um, Ivers. It's the mo the Confederate monument that people have a, a question and a concern about. Um, well, there are two Confederate monuments there. Are there? Yes. Great. One's one's a small plaque, I think, is it not? I'm not, I'm not sure about a Confederate monument. I think it, I think there is another one. That informational plaque that explains 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 that one as well as the, the fountain with the Union soldier and the Ivers. I mean, Denise Denise explicitly said she thought there were three separate items there that that related to the Civil War and. Right. Are daughters of the Confederacy that has the the white the white monument. tall concrete one, uh, and then there is the fountain that has a Union soldier on top, mm -hmm. and then there is the Ivers black soldier uh, monument, the, the new one, and those are the three. And then they have a plaque that, ex that gives all those three contexts. And that's what was done when we named Ivers Square. Understand there wanting there is public discussion and, and, and public push for that. Um, we've got a lot going on down there, so I was in tune with what Bob said. I drove by again today and looked, and I'm, so I do understand the need that we've got some time sensitive with construction. I would like more information from from staff on what that looks like and and and. And then what our process is going to be like. I don't. We we don't. We've never until today. We don't know what the process is like. And and and, and we do have three distinct. One is the Union soldier. One the daughters of the Confederacy, and then Ivor. So I thought we would. I thought we would be able to have the construction phase, take them down, and then revisit that whenever. <laughs> Welcome. When we, had, when, we, when we had an opportunity to gather more facts than just all of a sudden we're going to, you know, I mean, heck, you thought that right. one statue was put there in 1995 and then we find out that it was 
moved from the base of the bridge and it been up since 1931. Bali, how are you? Right. No, it was moved to its current location in 1995. Right. Oh, right. When, they, when the bridge was done. Right. The tour right. bridge down. I mean, so I, I guess my original thought still remains. Why don't we, if there is much to talk about, why not have it as an agenda item? Um, we can have it as an agenda item. That's fine. I, um, I that's it, up anyway. to council if they want to do that. Did you have a question you well, wanted Molly to? Are, we, are, you, are you asking for a, a specific vote, or are we talking about a study session item? I would say it would need to be a study session item if you want to, if you want to discuss it. I because guess I'm get... saying staff is, is asking council, what do you want to do about this monument? And I don't think right now is an appropriate time to answer that question. Personally, um, it's not on the agenda. It, it, I mean, that's just kind of how I feel procedurally about well, the but, reason for study but as session. well as there, there's, a, there's a lot of different thoughts and perspectives yeah. that that go into it, including that of staff. Um, but the reason for stu the reason for study sessions is to have that discussion. I, I never I meet with Scott I, every week. I didn't know we were being asked. Staff I, I thought there was a question in an email right. that we received. Hey. Well, so, I, I guess the question is, what is the, we were debating if, or discussing if there was, a, if it was already in the works that one or more of the current Ivor Square monuments are going to be taken down due to construction, and then we have time to right. talk about this issue. Oh, Mayor, Council Members, good evening. I've been watching the meeting from my office due to the space limitations okay. here, and saw the discussion and wanted to come down and clarify a couple of things. So first of all, regarding the construction of the City Hall facility, first and foremost, our preservation architects inventoried everything on the property, um, the structures, the monuments and everything uh, for our submittal to the State Historic Preservation Office to determine what's contributing historically to the site and what's not. So that was the first and foremost. So those monuments that um, are not historically significant to the site. For example, the police monuments will be relocated to the police station. The Ivers statue is being temporarily relocated because it is in the way when we remove the front of the Carnegie Library. So that will be temporarily relocated within the construction area um, elsewhere there for the uh, duration of the construction. Uh, there was a few monuments that the county took with them. They were memorials. Um, the county took those to the new facility over in Jackson. And then the other monuments that aren't directly in the way of construction were to remain in place, including the Confederate monument. Um, so just want to make sure that that was the current plan. Um, if the council does wish us to proceed differently, we, we will have to make arrangements for that. But. Um, that can certainly be discussed and whatnot. I just wanted you to know that um, that's what the current plan is. The fountain um, and the statue atop the fountain will remain in place for the duration of the construction. Uh, those really aren't in the way. It's really the Ivor statue that's directly there in front of the annex on the Carnegie Library that is at risk of being damaged. And so um, we are going to be temporarily relocating that on the property. Is there anything else that I can Clarify. Well, we don't know where that's going to be put back, though, do we? We do. We have we do. a um, actual site plan that shows a location. There will be a new sidewalk that comes into the new entrance of the new addition between the two facilities, um, and the Ivor statue will be located on the right hand of that sidewalk, kind of framed by the window in the Carnegie Library, which was the original doors of the building. It will be a window now, and it will provide a really nice backdrop. Um, for that statue. So that is the plan right now. Um, and I'd be happy to share that, that site plan with the council if you'd like to see a picture of what that looks like. But that site plan does not include uh, moving anything else? No, not at this time. It does not, no. Procedural question. The, is that CSA statue a part one of the state historical preservation statues that we would need to get there? Or what sort, what's that process look like? We, have, we haven't asked them because we weren't proposing any changes to its location or any uh, changes to the monument itself. So, um, and I'd have to go back and double check to see if it was considered contributing or not. Um, my 
um, assumption that it's not contributing to the site, but I would want to double check that. And then if we were to make any changes, it is possible that we would have to include that in our submission to SHPO. Um, they're currently um, under reviewing our proposed addition um, and the changes to the, the courthouse in Carnegie Library. The entire property is considered um, historic and therefore they are reviewing everything. Don't know if that helps or not, but wanted to come down and clarify. Okay. Uh, the, the well, I, to be a future item. I, I bring it up because I, I believe there's a growing uh, number of questions and concerns specifically about the Confederate monument. Um, and so if, if I, I think there needs to be a forum um, to allow people to express their concerns. Maybe people are here tonight to say, to say that just that, but I, it seems to me that <coughs> having it on the agenda would provide a, a more formal way for people to, you know, chime in or if we need to have a more robust discussion about it or make a give, give staff a, a you know, whether we want to move it to a different site, if that's something we need to discuss or, or move it within the park itself or, or anything like that. I've contended that it seems like a, just an odd place to have that particular monument. It's just kind of, <coughs> when anyone comes to the park, it's just front and center in what is now a park that honors our, uh, one of our, our uh, black citizens um, as a Union soldier. And it just seems like a weird place to have a confederate, confederate <laughs> monument well, they, to me. They went, they went um, through this whole discussion when they had meetings at the library when they were doing the, the Ivor statue. And at that time, they decided not to do anything with it. I would love to have Denise here for a discussion to revise everybody's I think memory. I that whole group that works, that on, works the whole, on the whole Ivor Square and here. And, and discussed it then. So is it a study session item or a... I, it's a study session item that okay. we need to put on there uh, maybe at our next meeting and and uh, publicize it. And I, I think it's just the <coughs> staff time to check in with, with Chimpo and, and make sure we have all of our, our, our answers for you uh, regarding all the, all the monuments. And okay. uh, so we can lay that out. We can also then reach out to, to Denise and others. So I might be able to give that ready in three weeks. I mean, <laughs> well, I, and the reason I said that is because our next meeting is not for three weeks. Right, if, right. if it doesn't look like that will work, then we can go to the second meeting in July. That make any difference. And, and then they can lay out the whole, uh, all, all the options. Okay. And then hear from those groups. We can also hear from the public. And um, then decide, of, of course, forward. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody have anything else? If not, we need to administer an oath of office to Councilman Gard. Where am I going, Neil? That's fine. Thank you. I don't want you to have to clean that thing. Do what? It's, that's next on the agenda. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Robbie Gard. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I possess. That I possess. All of the qualifications. All of the qualifications. For City Council Member Ward 4. For City Council Ward 4. As required by the laws of the state of Missouri. As required by the laws of the state of Missouri. And the charter and ordinances. And the charter and ordinances. Of the city of Cape Girardeau. Of the city of Cape Girardeau. I will support the Constitution of the United States. I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Missouri. The Constitution of the State of Missouri. And the Charter and Ordinances. And the Charter and Ordinances. Of the City of Cape Girardeau. Of the City of Cape Girardeau. I will faithfully demean myself. I will faithfully demean myself. In the Office of City Council Member Ward 4. In the Office of City Council Member Ward 4. Of the City of Cape Girardeau. Of the City of Cape Girardeau. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you, Gail. I'll let her sanitize for herself. No, no, no. Oh, okay. yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Not as good as spikes as what I'm used to using. Okay. So long, hard to
election, just like yours. And the next is the planning and zoning report. Is Ryan Durock out front? Did they show up? I didn't see anybody. He was here. Is, would, he be, would he be in the lobby out, maybe? First time for everything. Not there? I know he was here. I thought maybe he just walked out and was coming back in here. So, I guess we don't have a planning and zoning report this evening. Uh, any appearances for items that are not on the agenda this evening? If you'll just come to the front, state your name. It's all sanitized. My age is catching me. I could barely hear you. <laughs> David Goncher, resident Cape Girardeau. I live on Broadway. I'm the one that sent you the email. And I'll be brief. Uh, congratulations, Nate, Shannon. Good to meet you. Dr. Fox, Mayor, I want to appreciate it. Tell everybody I appreciate the time you've shown me over this ordeal. About the signs on Broadway. And uh, Stacy Kinder. I want to thank you for, I had to read it twice. It was so warm and eloquent that uh, under uh, me? <laughs> trying circumstances, your reply to my email was very nice. So, and I can assure you it was 100% professional. Well. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I'm just going to mention one thing. You've all got my email. You understand where I'm coming from. I think I've done enough research on it to show you that those signs do not belong there unless you go through the proper process which you just have taken an oath to uphold the policy, ordinance, law, statutes required by the city of you. Um, I called, uh, if you look on uh, your emails, which you probably don't have right now, but under each ordinance, there is a state law reference. State law reference is MoDOT. If you trespass on a state highway, they will probably come down and slap your hand and remove those signs for you. I had a conversation with two of them. They chuckled when I start telling them why I was calling and they said it's about the yellow signs, isn't it? And I said, yeah, so obviously they've been called more than just by David Goncher. So I just want you to know that Spanish Street, if you get a complaint and you decide to put them up on Spanish Street, MoDOT will be down the next day to pull them up because that's a state highway. They need to come up on Broadway. Uh, Broadway's been in existence 90 years. Started out as Harmony Street, which peel off right there in front of the church, now SEMO University Wilkening Center. That's Harmony. When Lewis Houck uh, donated the land for the stadium, they took it straight to West End. West End was the West End of town, and they renamed it Broadway. And uh, so Broadway is a city street. But if you do this on uh, State Street, no doubt will be down to pull them up for you. You should pull them up yourself. Uh, a bunch of us are not real happy in the neighborhood. And uh, we've estimated that those things have been hit by a 3,500 pound or larger vehicle traveling at a speed. Uh, probably not to exceed 25, 30 miles an hour, at least 30 to 40 times. You could tell by the dents, the chips, the knockdowns, the twisting, the black marks, etc. So they are more hazardous. They've, in the last six months, have had more accidents probably in the last 90 years that Broadway's been in existence. They are a hazard. It's not about safety. So you've got guidelines. I gave them to you. I uh, included my own personal opinion and asked some questions. And this is all very serious. There's a lot of people very upset and a lot of businesses upset because of those signs, they don't belong there. There's nowhere in your code, ordinances, laws, policies that require them nor demand them. And uh, you also have, which I didn't include, a 22 foot ratio at intersections and corners for proper turning and first respond vehicles. 
that's been violated. So those things violate everything that's on the books, and I'm just trying to do my homework and point that out. I know your next meeting's not till July 6th, but because I consider, and it's just not me, but I'm speaking for myself, that they are up illegally. There's no legal precedent set for those things that they come down to you, come to some type of resolution if it's required that you put them back up. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. <coughs> Staff, want to make any comments about the resolution? Um, I asked uh, our attorney, uh, Eric Cunningham, to take a look at uh, Obviously, whether they should or should not be put up is uh, is a, is a different matter. But as far as the uh, the ordinance authorizations, uh, one of the the main section that involves this is one that was not included in in uh, the email that was referred to. And it's in section 26-133, and it says the city traffic engineer is hereby authorized one to designate and maintain by appropriate devices, marks, or lines upon the surface of the roadway, crosswalks at intersections where, in his opinion, there is particular danger to pedestrians crossing the roadway, comma, and at such other places as he may deem necessary, period. And then two, to establish safety zones of such kind and character and at such places as he may deem necessary, for the protection protection of pedestrians, and that is from uh, Missouri State Statute Section 300.195. So I don't think there's any question under the ordinance or the statutes that the city traffic engineer has the authority to put them up there. Whether the city council wants to uh, direct something different is obviously up to you. But the city traffic engineer clearly under the ordinance has the authority to do it. And the, the only funding that I found ordinance is that it has to be a special needs assessment. So you can't take an individual who has a complaint, politicize it, and get this done because now that opens up for me to spend $5,000, which is a cost to date because I've got issues with this city too in their streets and sidewalks that I'd like corrected. You can't do that. I don't want to do that. I grew up in Cook County, Illinois, folks. I'm still related to it because my mother's going to be 94 Jan July 2nd. You don't want those kind of politics in Cape Girardeau. You want people to abide by the ordinances and laws. So there's more to that ordinance than that. You also have statute ordinance laws, policies, whatever you want to call them, on pedestrian behavior, on traffic behavior. And if there's been no research done. There's been no obsessive speeding or accidents on the corner of Frederick and Broadway to warrant those signs because research wasn't done. A traffic engineer didn't do his job because he wasn't asked to do his job to warrant those signs. There's a process in what I sent to you. Put the puzzle together, you'll find out they need to come down. Now. If you follow the process and a traffic engineer says, yeah, I think you need these signs, but we're going to have to do them all over the city because you just can't pick these individuals. I need to go over here and look at this and look at that. You know, and everybody lives with it if it's done right. But I can tell you Broadway's a putt-putt street. I live on it. I walk on it. I eat when I can on it. I run on it. I drive on it. I'm on it every darn day. And if I'm in a hurry, I go to Bellevue or I go to Independence. And I'm glad the police chief is in here because everybody speeds down those two streets. <laughs> Nobody speeds on Broadway. Okay? Thank you for your time. I, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I better sanitize a minute.
Next. Go ahead. Six feet. I'm Mike Welch. Uh, I live at 224 Independence. I've been enjoying the construction from below it. Uh, I want to talk about the signs, but I would like to speak to the police situation uh, and and our relations between African Americans and the police and so forth for just a second. Um, first of all, the, the issue really is not the statue. The issue is our relationship with our neighbors. That's really what it is and, and how they're, and the statue has come up and I wanna just, I mean, we talked about it for 20 minutes here and kind of beat around the bush with the statue and should it go here or there let me encourage you to take the lead and say, this is happening all over the country. People are talking, people are organizing seminars and talking and listening. And that needs to happen here. I've lived here for almost 30 years. I pastored in the south side of town. Uh, uh, I learned for the first time in my life uh, from, uh, from Councilman Moore and her family with whom we were close in those days what it's like to be a professional and still be followed around Walmart because they're wondering if you're going to steal something. And, and what it's like to be stopped and you haven't done anything wrong. I never knew that kind of stuff, did you? But I learned that we have no African American citizens in this town who have not experienced that. So, so we do need to have the discussion. And, and I think that I think the statue is a great way, a great place to start. And I, I'd encourage you to take the lead in saying we want to have a discussion, and we have this statue, and, and to have a you know to set aside a, a work session or whatever and publicize it, that it's only about that, and 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 our our race relations. That'd be good. Uh, I'm a cargo driver. I am in and out of downtown. I, I work late on Friday and Saturday nights. I, I've uh, done about uh, 10,200 or 10,300 cargo jobs, and about 4,000 of them are people, and probably 3,000 of those involve downtown. I, I sit on the street and nobody sees me, but I watch, and I watch our police. And I wanna say that uh, our police have been trained uh, I've watched all kinds of situations. I've watched racial situations. I've watched, you know, every kind of situation downtown. And, and our police need to be commended. They're, they're patient and uh, they, I, I posted it on Facebook the other day, they act like they enjoy the people that they're taking care of. And, uh, and so I, I, I haven't seen anything, but after, after, after uh, Chief Blair was here about, a, about a two years, uh, I, saw, I saw an incident on South Frederick, about the 600 block, 5600 block, and I didn't like what I saw, and it involved two African Americans on the street. And I went home and I emailed him. And uh, I emailed him in the morning, and by the end of the day, he had talked to both policemen who were involved and one of the citizens, and he called me and said, here's what I found out, and here's the resolution of all that. I was so pleased. I knew then what we had in a, in a, in a and I hope that that's the, I hope that's what, that's what other people's, uh, but because you know, we, we, we shouldn't be trusting the police. They're part of the government, and our job as American citizens is to keep an eye to monitor. Okay, the signs, I won't take very long. I, drive, I might drive, I might drive uh, uh, Broadway more than, uh, more than uh, Gauncher does, cause, uh, and I live two blocks away, and I'm a cargo driver, and uh, I am up and down that street constantly. Uh, I moved here, and I, I've lived down here since 1992 in this area of town. Right now, I just live two blocks away. And um, Broadway looked like a war zone when I moved here. 
it was an embarrassment. There were very few businesses, and the ones that were there weren't probably going to last very long. And a lot of the buildings were uh, not taken care of. Uh, I was pastoring on the south side, and uh, my wife uh, started walking Broadway and praying. That was about 98 or 99, and she did that for like three years, probably six days a week. She's persistent that way. And uh, <coughs> she was praying for our economy. She was praying for Broadway. She was praying for the downtown. Uh, and she was praying just for our city. And um, so we know Broadway. And I am so pleased at what Broadway looks like. You know, I, when, I often take, you know, customers I pick up at the hotels and so forth and take them uh, downtown Broadway just so they can see what our city looks like. And those signs, I, I like the 25, too. I, I live down here. I, I, think, I think it adds to our ambiance to have a slow MPH. But those signs, they look like, they, they, they look like, a, they look like a, a permanent construction zone. They're awful. And, and, uh, and, and I also know about the turning and so forth, and they have created a yield problem that I've never seen before. Those signs are misleading. And I, I read David's stuff on yielding. Those signs are misleading. People take opportunity to just walk out. And that's not the way the law reads on yielding. They just take an opportunity to walk out and casually walk. And, and traffic has to stop. So, um, then, and, then, and then I read the stuff about the procedure for instituting something. You know, a, a year ago... I've had, we've had four, four cars totaled in the 200 block of Independence in uh, about three and a half years. Drunk people coming up out of downtown. We've quit parking on that side of the street. We've had about that many have our, our, mirror, our mirrors clipped on the right side going down in the 200 block. So I went to City Hall a year ago this month and they sent me to a person named Green. I, I don't know that person, but I think it was a- uh, Kelly. Uh, I don't know. It was a woman. Right. Yes. Right. And uh, I, I told him I have. They sh and yes, she said, thank you. Uh, we're going to check at the history and we're going to see what's going on down there. And I'll get back to you. And I never heard again. Um, so, um, you know, the it's that's it's an, the, our, our traffic down here is important to us. And uh, and, and we do need to make deliberate steps to get things done right. And I went and looked about, about independence, and there's a process for putting in a stop sign. Or, and it's pretty complicated. And I, I, we darn sure need to do the same thing for those on Broadway. Thank you. Chuck Voss, my daughter Sophia, initiated the online petition for the removal of the uh, monument. Um, I was almost 40 when my first child, my son, was born. My wife and I had a conversation. This will be our only child. He's a year and a half old. We have that conversation again. Six weeks later, we have that conversation again. Four weeks later, eventually I realized that I was giving the wrong answer, and now I have two children, and thankfully she stopped asking after that. Um, Regarding the monument, I feel that we're at the same place. Um, the city doesn't have to do anything. The city can say no to removing the monument, but the voices calling for the monument's removal won't go away and will continue to get louder, and eventually that monument will go away. And it, but with the construction, this is as good a time as any, and I can't really see. I know that there's um, arguments for keeping it for part of the narrative, but. Um, I believe the monument needs to go, and this is as good a time as any. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service to Cape Girard. Thank you, Mr. Voss.
Yes, ma'am. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Brianna Clark. I'm 25 years old. I've lived here since right before my 11th birthday. Um, actually, Shatez Robinson kind of inspired me to come up here and say my piece about just living in Cape Girardeau. So, um, I, like I said, I moved here when I was about 10. I uh, lived in St. Louis all my life up until then. So, going to the education system in St. Louis as opposed to Cape was shocking to me. And that was from that young, you know what I mean? Um, granted, most of the school systems that I went to in St. Louis, we moved around a lot, so it was a lot of different schools, was predominantly black. But there was a certain way that we did things. Like February, we made sure that Black History Month was a, th was a thing. It was bulletin boards going up. There was extra special attention paid every day. On the over announcements, we heard a different name, what they contributed to us as a country that we all use. And to me, that made me proud to be black. Like, hey, these people that were grandchildren or even slave themselves were able to pull it up and become something to where we all needed this person. You know what I mean? And that's, that's just cool to think about. So when I moved here in sixth grade, it was a central middle school. Mr. Ellis was still the principal. So that was normal to me. I had, I had had white and black principals in St. Louis, so this was nothing new. February came around, I'm confused. I'm not hearing any jingles. I'm not seeing any bulletin boards. So I asked him, hey, what, what's going on? Like, I, it's Black History Month, what's up? You know, he was like, oh, well, we don't do that here. This, I'm as good as you're gonna get. And it kinda, yeah, like, it kinda made me like sad as a kid. I'm like, okay, you would think that, okay, I can get this at home, but my new friends, you know, they can't. They don't, They probably won't necessarily. They won't. Their moms don't teach them about Black History Month, so or Black History period, as opposed to just slave history, because we go way beyond that. The thing that really bothered me mostly about it is that these people that I went to school with were smart. They were clearly they were already here in this community, so I would imagine that they would become pillars in this community but they don't see me, you know, they don't see me as a person that can contribute higher. They see me as, okay, the black girl that probably started from slavery as far as what they are taught in the school. And to me, they just can open up just adding that, that extra thing, even if it is just the one month, adding that extra thing will let kids know like, hey, okay, maybe these are people, people that can contribute, people that can live out and do stuff greater than what they even started as, even if they did start out in a broken home or a broken neighborhood or something like that. And I go on to say this because I knew I was black from the time I could see, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was not a thing I didn't, I, I like it, it's my favorite thing. But I didn't, it wasn't real to me. It wasn't like pressed upon me until I came here. Until like somebody had made me realize, okay, you're black as opposed to like, you're just a person. You know what I mean? Like I was made to feel like, stay in your place almost. And it wasn't like blatant, nobody ever said, stay in your place, but that's how it felt. And that, if I felt that at sixth grade, going all the way up, and I was one of the smartest kids in my class in St. Louis, and I get it, this curriculum was a lot better. I'm so glad I came to Central because I felt like it was definitely a better school system than I would have gotten in St. Louis. But just that one little thing and being able to feel that extra pressure, just because I didn't have any black teachers that if I was feeling a way that I felt like would actually feel me about or understand my situation, or even that that was my only black principal that I've had since I've been here. And I had to protest, was my first protest was in sixth grade, hoping that he would stay. And I wasn't even gonna be in the school anymore. I just felt like even then that it was important to have that person as a voice that I could go to and say, hey, what is good with this? Or, you know, because like I said, we're all people here and we all might have walked through different walks. Y'all's might be similar to mine, but I don't know. So all I can go to is gravitate towards somebody that looks like me that I feel like would feel and understand where I'm coming from. And I felt bad as my siblings came up and. And honestly, it's one of the things that not necessarily Cape Girardeau, but like the country, it makes me not really want to bring a kid into the world. Like I don't have any kids and that was on purpose. Like I don't want them to have to grow up and feel lost or like for a while, I didn't like myself because I was black. And like I said, 
I, that's my favorite thing, you know? Like, that's one of my favorite things about me. So, when I felt like I was being pressured out of that or pressured to be different than how I am, that made me sad. And especially in retrospect, now that I am so proud about it. And I just want everybody to feel like if there's any black people watching oh, the council meeting or anything, it's okay, you know what I mean? Like, we are people too. And I want the students in Central now to actually have that education, you know, that roots and know that we can contribute. And then maybe when they are lawyers and such and such like that, then they'll be like, okay, this is a person. We've learned that just because circumstances don't mean that they can't change. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to come up and at least give my story and let y'all know that I am here and yeah, like how I feel. I don't know how many people are feeling the same way, but I can't be the only one. So yeah, that was all. Thank y'all. You're not. One of the more amazing things I've ever heard, and thank you for sharing. You started off with a, a great principal, Frank Ellis, who was a great teacher and a great, a great administrator. Good man. Need to lose him. Anybody else? Yeah. I didn't think you could sit out there and not say anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, my name is Calvin Bird. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I want to start off and say, this is my hometown. I was born here. Uh, I was raised here. Uh, my brother and I and our siblings, uh, we left Cape. I had an opportunity to leave Cape, but I chose to stay in Cape. And I stayed here because I love Cape. What's going on now is kind of challenging for us because Cape has never really had to deal with anything like this. And so what I would like to say is thank you, Stacy, for bringing up and bringing it to our attention. I just want to say we cannot bury our head in the sand and think that it's not going to come here. We cannot act as if it's not going to erupt because we got young people that have a voice. And I got two of them in my house, and one of them is studying to be a lawyer. And so every night at dinner, I have to go through this debate about, <laughs> Dad, you know, this is going to be like this. And I'm like, yeah, baby, it's going to be all right. Because you know, Dad, and she's a militant lawyer. And, and you know, she, she, she's a junior in college at SEMA. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, baby. She said, Dad, are you going to say something? You got to say something. I said, I'm saying something. She said, no, you're not saying it loud enough, Dad. I you're not saying <laughs> So let me start off by saying this. I think if we meet it head on mm -hmm. and not ignore it, perception is everything. What the letter you read was wonderful. I thought it was great. It addressed a lot of issues. But the fact that when we brought up about the monument and we said, okay, we're going to take care of it in one swoop, meaning that it'll be taken care of and it'll get moved, is the perception that we don't want to deal with that. And that's the perception. And we can't give that perception. We got to give the perception that, you know what, we're going to address it. Even though you already know what you're going to do, the Bible, well, yeah, I'm a preacher. Okay. <laughs> the Bible says that when Jesus was getting ready to feed the 5,000 people, when they brought him the fish and the five loaves of bread, and they said, what is this among so many? The scripture says that Jesus said, for he knew what he was going to do. In other words, he already had a plan. He already knew what was going to happen. You might already know that it's going to be moved and it can be moved. But even though you knew that, he said, sit the people down. Make them comfortable. Make them at ease. And then we'll deal with it. So if you know what you're going to do, make the people at ease. Sit them down. Make them comfortable. Let them know that your city, your voted in representatives care about you. The young lady's 25, she's a transplant. I see all of these young people in here. They not, they not, they weren't. Some of them were born here, a lot of them were transplant. We don't know where they come from, but we glad they're here. Mm -hmm. Let's make them feel like we care about them. Let's make them feel like their voice does matter. And not just blow it off and not just say, oh, by the way, but let's 
give it some attention. It might be frustrating. It might take you an extra hour in a meeting. It might do that. But you know what? It's worth it. It's worth it because they're worth it. I'm worth it. Our voice matters. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Your daughter be proud of you, Calvin. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tell, tell Miracle she's welcome here. I'd like to hear from her. Not that I'm standing to diddle what he said, because I agree with him. But I stand because I want to encourage these young people mm -hmm. to keep doing what you're doing. It's not every day that we see that. And the way we're seeing you respond is far better than what we're seeing across our country. Mm -hmm. right? And before it gets to that point, it's very important that you hear that voice. I was a little bit of, mm, I don't want to say angry, because angry is not a good word. And the Bible says anger is not. not. But I was a little upset regarding the response that was given to that young man a couple of weeks ago when he made a statement and you said, well, maybe 10 years, 10 years down the road. And he said, I may not even be here in 10 years. Now, I have a son. He's a big kid. All birds, most of the birds are big kids. <clears throat> they got some weight on them. <laughs> but they're not afraid. Mm -hmm. And we teach them to stand up for their rights. We encourage them for education. My father was a great man. Yes, he was. Sat on, sat on the school board, first black on the school board. So we're standing on soldiers of great people in our neighborhood and in the city. But as me, standing here, I want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Your voice counts and that we're here for you. I have, uh, I have some concerns regarding that statement because that, those, those parties that made those statements they're supposedly or possibly potential leaders of this community. And, and that, that bothered me. That bothered me. And I know it didn't just bother me, it bothered some other people too. And so I, I encourage you to be mindful of the thoughts and the statements that you do make, because we all are gonna be held accountable for what we say and for what we do. And you may not understand how I look at it, but you need to understand by conversation that it's important to us if we come to you and say something to you mm -hmm. that is important to us, that you at least hear us and at least respond with a hearing ear, not just, oh yeah, they just came to say something. Because most people don't just talk to be talking. Most of the time they talk because there's a purpose behind their conversation. So be attentive to what needs to be said and what's being said. And let's not keep this elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Let's get the elephant out the room. And let's be honest and kind enough, candid with ourselves regarding our biases, our differences, so that we can move past this, so that we can encourage the next generation that they can do better and it's going to get better. But we can't do that if we keep bypassing, thinking it's not, they don't mean anything. And I'm gonna tell you, this thing is not temporary and it's not going away just like that. There are a lot of people that are involved. There are a lot of people that are doing things behind the scene to try to keep this thing from erupting. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be mindful of what you hear and what you see and be careful in how you respond. Because how we respond mm -hmm. is gonna be how people are going to react. Mm -hmm. And if you can get in front of it, we can head off a lot of things that will not cause this city to be one plastered <laughs> all over Missouri. I, mean, I, I hope I didn't. Well, no. I said what I said. I, Pastor Bird, I want to I want to mention something. I'm going to be I'll address the elephant in the room. I'm the one that said something about ten years, and Mr. Robinson and, and Pastor Bird. I meant nothing by it pawning it off to ten years. It was just something about we do have a strategy, and that's one strategy, and that's a long term strategy. Obviously, there are a lot of short term strategies that we we've got going on. Numerous council members, including myself have helped to support and will support and have out, been outspoken about purpose built, about the porch group, and about that. So I, I didn't mean to say 10 years, and I want to, I'll I'm, officially I'm, apologize, but nobody said 10 years. It was me, and, and you know, right, but I didn't mean that to be I'm, something that we were 
putting off for 10 years and just, we're not going to worry about today. It was a bad choice of words in that respect, but I, 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 I obviously, I did not mean that in that way. What's, I, Scott, the council knows how much I have fought for certain yeah, things see, going and the, forward. I know, and maybe they didn't. It's not about the council, but it's about the statement that you made and, it, and the impression and what people thought of when you said it. And if I don't call you on it, no, and, and being, you're being a pastor in the city and, help, and being a leader amongst this community, then nobody else will. But they will, but it won't be the way that you want. Fair enough. And I, and I and, understand. And the other thing is, and I'm going to be honest with you, you keep talking about purpose built, you keep talking about all this other stuff. If they don't do nothing, Robbie, it's up to this city council and the city to come together Absolutely. and get some things done. So quick, quick. Quit passing the ball. I'm not passing the ball, but it is one piece that we are trying to work with. And if Purpose Built and, and the porch group dissolve and there's nothing, we're going to move forward with the things within the concept of bringing our, our community together, of supporting education, supporting that community. I don't care if Purpose Built comes to Cape Jard or not. It's the concept and the direction. That's what I care about. We will talk again. My time is up. <laughs> Not unless I could be like I, I was at church. Just give me about four more minutes. <laughs> four more minutes? Four more minutes. <laughs> Even chance to say. But I won't do that. <laughs> but, but we are we are going to come together. We are. And we're going to get it together with your help. Like you said, there's a lot of people working behind the scenes. And so we're going to get it done. Young man. Young man. I just did that over you. I know. Sorry. Get intense. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to keep everybody not sick. Mm. Thank you. Um, so I kind of have the same message, but maybe a little different approach to the message. And I appreciate you raising the issue and even your article that you, the letter to the editor, Stacy, that you submitted. Um, acknowledging um, the points that you acknowledged um, and um, I heard your passion and your grace in that and your challenge to the rest of us and you said things in a very um, graceful way and uh, thank you for that um, I'm not so graceful so I'll just kind of come out um, so um, through our ministry we've been hosting um, how, uh, the Spiritual Discipline of Anti-Racism. And we're using a book by Ibram Kendi, who is a historian, a scholar, and um, this book is called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And I really encourage you to get this book and work through it. And I even offer myself to you to help you process through that. Kendi suggests that we are either racist or anti-racist. He says that the good news is that it's not a tattoo that we wear, but a removable badge. And whether we're racist or anti-racist depends upon how we show up in every situation. And so as I hear this conversation, it would, you would not call yourself racist. I know you would not. But the conversation does stem from a space of racism. And so the anti-racist approach to this would be for the people who look like me and you to step back and listen to the people who are really impacted by the decisions that are made in regards to the Confederate statue. When a bunch of white people get into a space and they are the ones who decide whether a statue is offensive or not offensive, relevant or not relevant, significant or not significant, we are making decisions based upon a history that is laden with turmoil and turmoil and trauma that has been inflicted upon people who don't look like us. It is not our right to make that decision. And that whole sense of paternalism is the racist perspective. That is upholding a system that has been in place for oppression for many years. Now we can decide to continue that way or we can decide to be better humans. And that's what I hope that this time compels us to be. We can write lovely letters, but the letter itself is racist 
if it isn't followed through with action that is anti-racist. So we can't talk about how inclusive we are and how sorrowful we are, but yet continue to make decisions that rebut our sorrow because the decisions that we make and the positions that we take are really the message that's being sent no matter what letter. So when we send a letter out that says we're very sorrowful, all that really is is a dog whistle, bells and whistles for people who look like us who want to feel calm in this time of turmoil. But it doesn't do anything for the people who are impacted by the policies that cause the oppression. So we really have a lot of work to do. And it's so much more than just writing letters and holding forums because forums in itself are perfunctory if the people who are leading the forum look like us. We have to listen to gather information to apply to anti-racist practices. Not so that we can say we gather people and we're good white people because we listen to them, but then we turn around and did exactly what we wanted to do anyway. And that is a consistent that happens in our community. People gather together, they share their voices, and then people in decision-making places go on with the decisions that they already intended to make. So if we are really going to be a better city, we have got to have better practices. And this is the time for us to adopt this. How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ingram Kendi. Has a workbook, has videos, all kinds of resources on his website, and I will be glad to help lead you through the process we can do a Zoom, you can do it on your own, we just need to do it because people are suffering and they're hurting and they're ready for their voices to be heard, but in an authentic way. Inclusion is not just having people who look different than us in spaces. Inclusion is absolutely hearing voices and making decisions based upon what we heard. Oh, you beat the bell too. Uh -huh. Anybody else? If not, we'll go into agenda, agenda review. Oh, yeah. Mayor Fox, we when we were when I had mentioned the the signs issue earlier, we, you, I think I think you'd indicated we would circle back to it after hearing. I guess my, my, my question remains on, on that. Uh, how, how do we move forward? I think we'll move forward with staff getting information from the Historical Society on where we stand there, and we'll have a study session and talk about I'm sorry, it. the Broadway signs. Oh, the Broadway signs. Right. Oh, I thought you were talking about the monument. Broadway signs, you know, we, unless somebody wants to make a motion that we do something different, we had a discussion and everybody pretty much decided to keep them there. Well, was my, through my discussion with Scott Meyer on Friday, uh, or Thursday, I was under the understanding that from our last meeting, the CID and Old Town Cape were compiling uh, an opinion or, or some information. That was a discuss that our lab, you brought that up actually, Stacey, um, about the CID mm -hmm. and Old Town Cape, mm -hmm. and then in my decision, I thought that we were. Um, they were looking for some other signs some besides those. Study as they stood right now, and that would be brought back to us at the end of the summer. Okay. I don't know if that's changed since then. I mean, this whole thing, when it started, was to put them up temporarily, and then study and see how they would, if they would slow traffic down, and. See, that's okay. where I feel like we are now, because well, they've been up during a, a, a pretty good-sized trial run. I have not seen any information about any study that's been done. Right, right. That's what I'm trying, trying to point out. And so, how well, do we, because I, I, what I'm concerned about is that we're going to, at every meeting, we're going to keep having people standing up saying, we love the signs, and people yeah. saying, we hate the signs. And I think staff is looking to the council for a direction, but there's been no, we haven't gone through the process that we talked about a year ago in terms of determining whether we want the signs or not. Is there any way the signs can be, if, if we absolutely need these signs, and I don't think anyone here is suggesting the safety of the community and the downtown area and patrons of businesses on Broadway, I don't think that's right. No, the issue really, they obstruct 
That's why I understand Old Town Cape and the downtown organization was going to look at other other signs that might serve the same purpose. Right. Well, and so I guess my uh, bringing up the, the my my initial point, can we have this as an agenda item in which at some point in which we hear from staff in which we hear from uh, again more community if they if they choose to come and also discuss possible alternatives if it is shown that this that slow down signs are needed and we haven't even really heard yet on that verdict uh, officially um, but if they are needed are there even better ideas better solutions than what we currently have right Right, and so it, it, it's just there's a lot of questions, I guess. And I, I, I know there are questions, and, and I, I understood that they were going to do a study on speed and report back to us. Is that not right? That is correct. We were going to study speed with them and without them. We've done, we've done uh, studies previously uh, without them, and we're going to study them with them. And uh, then we were also getting input from uh, the CID and Old Town Cape, and uh, we'll bring those results to you. Okay, like in a study session again with yeah. the uh, with the Confederate Monument. That'll be a big fun meeting. <laughs> yeah, it may not come in the same meeting, but we, yeah, we'll okay. we'll bring them to you when we have. Well, that was have my that understanding. So I I didn't yeah. think it needed to be an agenda item until that stuff is done, and we get. I don't know that it does. I, I'm just, I hadn't heard. I hadn't heard any of this. So, but. Well, they need to come down immediately. Let, let me read you section 25-26-25, traffic studies, traffic accident studies. Whenever the accidents at any particular location become numerous, the traffic division shall cooperate with the city traffic engineer in conducting studies of such accidents and determining remedial measures. Not an association, not an individual, it's right there. I put the puzzle together for you. It's in your email. There's a proper way to do this, not to get the community involved. There's two people involved, traffic division and a city traffic engineer. And they make the determining factor on a particular location with numerous accidents. There's no numerous accidents on Broadway. It's a putt putt street. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So that's where we're at. We'll hear back from staff. Great. Thank you. Agenda review. Now, Council, we have um, no public hearings tonight. Uh, we do have a robust uh, consent agenda. Uh, we'll be having the second and third readings of the National Incident Management System. Um, the uh, zoning of property on Frederick Street, the zoning of the property on North Middle Street, uh, the record plat at Baldwin Place, the uh, Chapter 30 amendments, amendments in the uh, Central Business District, uh, and as well as this, these two special tax bills for uh, demolitions that took place, and then the Transportation Planning Consolidated Grant Agreement. Um, those were read uh, previously and passed uh, the first reading. Number 10 is the release of the performance guarantee on Hopper Crossing. And then 11 is the public, accepting the public improvements for the, the uh, improvement at 3093 William Street. Um, number, uh, we did remove an item from the consent agenda. We had uh, some small changes to the alarms bill that you passed first reading last time. Uh, we had uh, some of the, we had re referred to them as, an, as a fine and a fee and we needed to make all those all be fees and then we had a clarification of how much the fee would be over uh, i believe it was eight times we needed to be specific on those so we made those two changes and we would need you to amend it uh, from last time in order to be clear that there was a change um, so that will be number 12 the and the item removed from the consent we have two uh, new ordinances today uh, we have the record plat of duet subdivision and then we have the permanent utility easement of morgan distributing uh, Morgan Distributing, there was a change on that uh, from the original uh, packet because it, uh, it noted it was in, Saint, in the city of Cape Verde and it's in the county. So uh, need to, do we need to amend that or just note it? No. 
Okay, so just note it's that. Already changed. So it's, it's already changed been changed. Stuff. It's in. It's changed in the packet. It's changed electronically, and it's changed in your um, in your packets as well. So uh, those are done, and then we uh, have the uh, four appointments tonight: the uh, airport advisory board, uh, the, the CID with Cape Dogwood, uh, the public uh, library board, as well as uh, the city council committee and positions. I believe you have a proposal on that, Mayor, and that's all I have. We don't have the uh, list for appointments up here. We're missing all the sheets. We're missing all the sheets. Sheets for appointments. For Airport Advisory Board, for Cape Dogwood, and for Public Library. Sorry? Were there only? <coughs> There were just a. Well, there was a new. There is a new. I mean, there is a recommendation for airport board. Okay. So. Sorry about that. Go off of what's what was on the recommendation on the agenda attachment. Right. I'm assuming it was a mistake that we didn't get the ballots, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Correct. So we could just go off. The recommendation if somebody wanted to make a motion at that time. Or if you want to have a discussion about it, you're certainly welcome to All right. discuss it. work. That will work. Uh, we'll now adjourn to or go into regular session. We'll have a call to order. And roll call. Bob Hart. Here. Robert Here. 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 I'll now entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Robbie, seconded by Dan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no public hearings tonight. Uh, are there any individuals here this evening to make comments about any item on the agenda? Any item on the agenda this evening? If not, we'll move to the consent agenda. Eric? Number 20-84, an ordinance adopting the National Incident Management System as a standard for incident management by the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. An ordinance adopting the National Incident Management System as a standard for incident management by the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Number 20-86, an ordinance made Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing zoning property located at 305, 307, and 309 North Frederick Street in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from RUMD to NC. An ordinance meeting Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing zoning of property located at 305, 307, and 309 North Frederick Street in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from RUMD to NC. Number 20-87, an ordinance meeting Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located at the southeast corner of North Middle Street and Bellevue Street in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from RUMD to CBD DCC. An ordinance meeting Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located at the southeast corner of North Middle Street and Bellevue Street in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from RUMD to CBD DCC. Number 20-88, an ordinance proving the record plan of Baldwin Place Phase 3, an ordinance proving the record plan of Baldwin Place Phase 3, Bill Number 20-89, an ordinance making Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, regarding CBD Central Business District, an ordinance making Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, regarding CBD Central Business District. 20-92, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of a special tax bill for property located at 33 North Henderson Avenue for the demolition of a dangerous building and for the abatement of a nuisance under the provisions of Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. An ordinance authorizing the issuance of a special tax bill for property located at 33 North Henderson Avenue for the demolition of a dangerous building and for the abatement of a nuisance under the provisions of Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Number 20-93, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of a special tax bill for property located at 1217 North Water Street for the demolition of a dangerous building under provisions of Chapter 7 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. An ordinance authorizing the issuance of a special tax bill for property located at 1217 North Water Street for the demolition of a dangerous building under provisions of Chapter 7 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. 
and bill number 20-94 an ordinance authorizing city manager to execute a transportation planning consolidated grant agreement with Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission for Southeast Metropolitan Planning Organization expenses and the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri an ordinance authorizing city manager to execute a transportation planning consolidated grant agreement with the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission for Southeast Metropolitan Planning Organization expenses in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. You have before you the consent agenda. Seven Motion Seven. Mr. Gard. Second, Second by Nate. Nate. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-91, an ordinance amending chapter 15 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri regarding emergency service alarms. An ordinance amending chapter 15 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri regarding emergency service alarms. Uh, the motion and the second can be in um, those motions, including the changes that are in the attached document. Okay. If that's what's everybody intended. understood that, including the changes that, that were added. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Bill number 20-96, an ordinance approving the record plat of DeWitt subdivision. Seven. Motion by Ravi. Second. Second by Dan. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Bill number 20-97, an ordinance accepting the permanent utility easement from Morgan Distributing Incorporated for 4110 Nash Road in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Second. Not actually the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Okay, strike that. <laughs> an ordinance accepting a permanent utility easement from Morgan and Distributing it for 4110 Nash Road. Second. Okay, motion by Dan. Do I hear second? Second. Second by Nate. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Sorry, I forgot to cross that out. Appointments. All right. Mayor, I make a motion to appoint Beverly Cleary to a Clear. term. Clear. Clear, sorry. Uh, for a term expiring April 30th of 2023 as well as reappointing Mark Welker and Jeff Bruni for terms expiring April 30th of 2023. Motion has been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Dan. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Appointments to Cape Dogwood Community Improvement District Board of Directors. Mayor, make an appointment to appoint Mark Hogan, James Limbaugh, and an Anad Patel Jr. to a term that will expire July 1st of 2024. Motion is made. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Stacy. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Appointment to the Public Library Board of Directors. Mayor, make a motion to appoint or to reappoint Amy Trueblood, John McGowan, and Rika Patterson for terms expiring June 30th of 2023. Motion has been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Nate. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, you know Rika Patterson. She's a girl basketball coach. You don't know? <coughs> you should. She's a great lady. Uh, appointment of city committee, city council committee and board positions. Did you all get a copy of this? Yeah, I wasn't I didn't I wasn't able to pull it up either, I think. Uh they're pretty much the same, and I'll go over these. Dan Preston's the uh, Red Star NDI Comprehensive Plan Oversight Committee and Parks and Rec Advisory Board Liaison. 
Uh, Shelly Moore's Old Town Cape Board of Directors, and that's per contract because she's in Ward 2. Purpose Built Community, the South NDI, and SNAP. Uh, Nate Thomas, Comprehensive Plan Oversight Committee, Public, Facil Public Facilities Authority, and a new position that uh, called Legislative Liaison. And uh, I think that is a, it's a good one with Nate's experience uh, to kind of keep track and uh, keep us uh, up to date on legislation that's going on. He'll have the help of staff and uh, then if uh, time comes that he needs help with us doing different things to notify people or make trips to Jeff City, we can do that to help. Uh, Robbie Gard, still Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Simpo Board Directors Alternate, the Enhanced Enterprise Zone and Magnet. Uh, Shannon Truxell, uh, Cape Parks and Rec Foundation and the Keith Cape Beautiful Committee. Stacy Kennedy, Airport Advisory Board, the Comprehensive Plan Oversight Committee and Purpose Built Community. Any questions? I don't motion for that. So move. So move. So here a second. Second by Shannon. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I don't have any other business. I will entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session to discuss issues and revise section section 610-021 including but limited to legal actions litigation confidential communication with legal counsel and personnel matters second we will adjourn to closed session for a brief time <laughs> I promise.